Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, this is our program from the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, and it is a very interesting session today uh, on a very important topic, and that is Turkey. Uh, those of you who do not regularly follow the turkeyanalyst.org, you should be doing so because uh, as a reader myself, I can tell you it has had some of the most significant articles and analyses of Turkish affairs published anywhere. Turkeyanalyst.org. Among our speakers will be its founder. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, return to him in a moment. The subject is Turkey 2020, 2022. In other words, Turkey in the era of the Ukraine-Russia war uh, and the impact of those developments, both domestic in Turkey, what's going on, what are their strategies and policies, and the uh, collateral impact of the war itself on the Caucasus and on Central Asia clear to Afghanistan. This is a very big topic, which wasn't a big topic a generation ago. After the collapse of the USSR, Turkey would really rubbed its eyes because the, the Turkic peoples to the east were uh, really quite unknown to most, to most Turks. That's changed. They're, they today have a very active policy that we're going to hear about. And we're also going to hear about the response to that policy. And in the end, we want to consider finally the, uh, the best possible responses to this from the United States and Europe. So there we are. And, and we're going to begin today uh, uh, with uh, Swat Kenikliolu, who I'm, I want to welcome. Very good to see you and, and glad you, you're able to join us. Uh, he was a, is a former member of the Turkish parliament and, and very active in Turkish public affairs today. Uh, let us turn to you immediately, Suat. Well, thank you. I thought Matt was going to start, but oh well. <laughs> um, I'll do the, uh, the opening. Um, well, uh, as you said, um, when the uh, Soviet Union disintegrated, uh, there was very limited knowledge about um, uh, both the Caucasus and Central Asia. I remember those days when uh, people who were learning Russian in Ankara were de facto seen as potential spies and <laughs> were suspect people. It was so um, distant to many Turks. And I think, except from the, uh, the pan-Turkic small fringes of, of the, the nationalist right who had, you know, of course, a, long, a more longer memory about the region, the um, the Turkic world or Central Asia and, uh, and the Caucasus were very much um, distant and and for those who were um, involved in it, it was more of a romantic involvement, not one uh, that people had seen those geographies. Uh, there were people who had you know uh, family members who were originally from those areas, but due to the Cold War, very little direct contact with these regions. Um, but of course, a lot has changed. Um, Turkey has caught up uh, in quickly. Uh, the early years were marked by Özal's activism, Demirel's, both President Demirel and Özal's activism, the famous dictum that a new Turkish, Turkic world had emerged from the Adriatic to the Chinese wall, etc. But I think after, um, the, you know, after President Demirel's political, uh, when his political, active political life came to an end, I think the region, uh, unfortunately, became a more backwater for uh, for for Turkish for, for Turkish foreign policy. Um, also, the AKP initially had not really a a, a, a very um, uh, active, uh, not not a very proactive engagement with the region. I think after the initial in euphoria and enthusiasm, it became clear that Turkey's uh, economic capacity uh, would not be able to match the expectations of many of these Turkic uh, governments. Though the, in the cultural, economic area, you know, fields there were um, 
contacts and still continue to be uh, between those countries. I would single out Azerbaijan as an exceptional case. Probably Matt will go into that as well. But Azerbaijan, both um, linguistically and geographically being closer to Turkey, um, and of course, uh, energy interests in, um, from the Caspian Sea, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline made obviously Azerbaijan a more exceptional case for Turkey rather than Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, or Uzbekistan. So, um, uh, and as, as we know from very recent um, <clears throat> uh, military uh, activity in, uh, in Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, Turkey has now become um, an important player in, in uh, a, a big brother for uh, Azerbaijan in its confrontation with Armenia. Uh, and of course, an interesting player as a country that has a very complicated, compartmentalized relationship with Moscow, ranging from northern Syria to the Caucasus, to the Black Sea, to Libya, and now, very interestingly, of course, what's happening in Ukraine, namely the Russian invasion of Ukraine, let's call it what it is. Um, and um, we see, uh, I mean, in many respects, uh, when, when I entered parliament in 2007, um, Ismail Jem, former um, <clears throat> foreign minister, Ismail Jem's and the DSPs from 1999 till 2002, foreign policy, which they described as region-based foreign policy, um, it was really um, the, uh, the basis on which the AKP, when they took over in late 2002, which they continued in many respects. Mr. Davutoglu, of course, uh, described it as uh, zero problems with neighbors, whatever you want to call it, Turkey had a great appetite uh, to, um, to steer away from its more traditional confrontational policies vis-a-vis -vis Greece, uh, Iran, Russia, and others. And we see already the, you know, the, the, the deepening of the relationship between Moscow and Ankara, especially after 2004, uh, after President Putin's first historic visit to Ankara. Uh, and then the Eurasia Action Plan, of course, which deepened and sort of um, <clears throat> took away the mutual suspicion that came about from Russia's support to the PKK and Turkey's involvement in Chechnya. Uh, but um, I think for the more recent and more um, current, um, <clears throat> in the interest of speaking of the more current uh, era, I would say uh, Turkey has now, by now, uh, especially during the AKP's golden years, which I would describe as 2003 to 2011, roughly, uh, Turkey had become a country uh, that, especially Azerbaijan, but probably many other Turkey countries also aspired and looked upon, uh, especially when the EU process was going well and Turkey looked like as a predominantly Muslim country that was seriously engaging with Brussels about membership. I think in those years, I've certainly felt it when I was in parliament, not only from the Caucasus and Central Asia, but also from the Middle East, from many Blacks, from the Balkans for sure, uh, we saw many countries looking at Turkey as, a, uh, as an inspiration. I don't think Ankara was keen on pre presenting itself as a model, but the, the international media was very keen to portray Turkey in that way. But um, uh, I think, uh, you know, after the initial sort of pro-activism of Özal and Demirel uh, those years, I think there has a, a, a more realistic sense has settled in in Ankara, what can and what cannot be done with, uh, with the Central Asian ethnic um, brothers or, or, or brethren. And I think it's become very uh, much uh, more, uh, rather than seeing the region as a whole, a lot more on a bilateral level with each country, what Turkey can or cannot do. Certainly in Uzbekistan, I mean, Turkey's relations with Uzbekistan have certainly changed quite a bit after Karimov's demise. And so, uh, I, you know, I think it would be fair to say, rather than this sort of pan-Turkic or uh, sort of global approach to the region, Turkey looks at them more on a bilateral level with 
Azerbaijan really standing out as an exception. As you know, President Aliyev did not have a very constructive way at looking at the AKP at the early years, but that changed over time. And now I think the both sides uh, have come to uh, understand that, well, they first they need each other. And secondly, um, that realpolitik and cold you know, interests dictate what they personally might be thinking about each other. And I, I think that's been a dramatic change. We have seen this especially in how Azerbaijan has been able to recover some of the uh, occupied territories in Karabakh and how um, I think also culturally Azerbaijan, the Azerbaijani people uh, is keen to, uh, to be to, to see themselves as part of Turkey or the, the Turkish sort of presence that expands from the Balkans to the Black Sea and of course to the Caucasus. Um, now, of course, uh, I maybe, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but let me just uh, make one point, of course, about Azerbaijan's special relationship with Israel, which uh, is, is a special one. Uh, and I think before the fallout, the AKP's fallout in 2008, 2009 with Israel, uh, that was something that was appreciated uh, on, all, on all three sides. And now we see after a long <clears throat> uh, cooling off between the two sides, Turkey and Israel now again trying to make up and, and understand, especially in view of uh, Eastern Mediterranean hydrocarbon resources, sure Matt is going to talk about that as well. Um, uh, they, they understand they have to work with each other. And I think if Turkey, Israel and Azerbaijan could find a, a, a basis to have, you know, a trilateral cooperation, I think that would be uh, mutually for all three sides, very, very beneficial. I think they, they understand that. So I mean, in all in all, let me just close off with, uh, you know, from 1991, 1992, we have seen different phases of how Turkey has engaged with the region. Uh, and I hope we will have time to talk about Ukraine as well in the, uh, the, the coming rounds, because I think that will probably change uh, the region. It will certainly change the Black Sea region. Uh, it will probably have repercussions to the Caucasus, South Caucasus for sure. And of course, to Russia itself. We don't know how this will all end up, uh, but there's certainly a potential that there could be changes in Russia and that could have quite quite important repercussions for Turkey, for Azerbaijan, and even for the North Caucasus, who knows? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting indeed. We're going to turn now to Matthew Bryza, uh, uh, Ambassador Bryza. He served uh, for a year in uh, U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan. He's a Chicagoan. He, he uh, uh, he uh, served in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. He, he was U.S. Ambassador representative to the Minsk Group, a much de bit debated phenomenon. And, <laughs> and he is currently engaged in business and other operations while continuing his international and diplomatic interests. Uh, Matt Bryza, good to see you. Great to see you, too. I'm really honored to be together with you and Swat and Svante and the best minds there are out there in this part of the world. And Suat opened up with a perfect, you know, Tour de Horizon on the last few years of how Turkey, pardon my French, uh, <laughs> has been looking at the South Caucasus, Central Asia, and beyond. So I don't want to rehash that ground. There's so many things to comment on, but it would be totally boring because I would simply be agreeing with Suat on, on everything he said. Um, and so before maybe turning to energy and, and, and more in-depth discussion of Azerbaijan, maybe for the questions and answers, Maybe I'll fast forward to right now and to sort of the title of, or at least what, what, what uh, Mamuka was describing, uh, he'd like me to talk about, which is in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, what does it mean for Turkey's approach to the Caucasus and Central Asia? And I've been pondering this for the last several days, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like philosophically interested in, in, in the genesis of even the question, um, because I think it reflects the conventional wisdom, certainly in Washington, as well as in Paris and in Brussels and other uh, allied NATO allied capitals, that 
Turkey has moved away from that policy of zero problems with neighbors, neighbors that SWAT mentioned, and, and had fallen into or adopted a policy of, uh, of zero neighbors without problems <laughs> and without serious problems. Uh, and that, I think there was a shift uh, a year ago, well, in the summer of 2020, I'll, I'll come to in a moment, but, you know, when, uh, when there was the coup attempt here in 2016, July, uh, that, that was a, an earthquake, a tectonic move in, in the politics of Turkey, both domestically and internationally. And the, the, I think there was a deeply held belief at the highest level of the government here in Turkey, and SWAT knows these people extremely well, um, that the U.S. must have been behind the coup somehow. I mean, how could it be that Fethullah Gülen, who uh, runs this cultish organization from Pennsylvania, uh, simply who has a residency permit in the U.S., uh, encouraged this all to happen or allowed it to happen, and the U.S. government either knew nothing or didn't or didn't want it to happen. Um, I think that, I, from my perspective, that's a total misperception. But even my U.S. educated, you know, college uh, business partner, uh, who whose family earned their fortune in a JV with Chrysler and Dodge, he even looked to me uh, the, the the night after the coup and said, "Where well, where were you last night?" Thinking somehow because I'm a former U.S. official, I live in Istanbul. Maybe I had something to do with the coup. So I think the one thing we need to begin with is that the coup attempt uh, really. Uh, was 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 an earth shattering event for many, I think, in the upper echelons of the Turkish government and re really made them think that uh, the US and, and maybe NATO allies are out to get them. And there are even some NATO allies who suggested it might have been better if the coup had succeeded. Well, that's one key point that led the way. And that opened the door for, for Vladimir Putin to whisper in uh, President Erdogan's ear at the time or prime minister at the time uh, that we, the Americans, were behind it all. Uh, and the United States didn't, you know, the, uh, President Obama did, didn't make a public statement for days about how it would have been great. I mean, thank goodness the coup didn't, didn't succeed. Uh, it's not acceptable uh, for uh, there to be a coup attempt against a democratically elected NATO member state government, uh, regardless of how many, many concerns we may have about democracy in Turkey. That would have been a geostrategic loss for the U.S., it took a long time for that statement to come out, several days from Obama. In the meantime, Putin was laying the, uh, laying the foundation for what ended up being, I think, uh, the decision by Turkey to buy the Russian uh, S-400 air defense system. So that, that was one big set uh, of events that began to change uh, the mood in Turkey. I think a second one was the failure of the UN-brokered Cyprus talks, uh, when in, I guess it was the summer of 2017 in Crown Montana, Switzerland, the last best hope for a settlement that would have maybe reunified the island into a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation uh, failed. And from what I heard from people inside, I mean, like on the UN team, Turkey put everything on the table and things that the Greek Cypriots and Greeks had wanted for decades. And still that wasn't enough. And when, when that was rejected, when the Turkish proposal was rejected, I think Ankara decided, okay, that's it. Enough of us holding back on Eastern Mediterranean oil and gas exploration in the hope there'd be a Cyprus settlement. Uh, enough of us trying to have zero problems with neighbors. We're going to assert our rights as we interpret them in the Eastern Mediterranean and, you know, damn the torpedoes, <laughs> maybe literally and figuratively. Uh, and, and I think that it came to be seen in Ankara that that was a failing strategy. It didn't work. All it did was engender massive hostility and animosity from, from uh, Emmanuel Macron, who sent fighter jets to, to Crete from the UAE. Uh, and, and there was a collision of the naval vessels, with a Greek one and, and, and a Turkish one in the Eastern Mediterranean in the summer of 2020. Um, and the good news is then uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, stepped in and brokered de-escalation talks between the militaries of Greece and Turkey. And then Chancellor Angela Merkel also stepped in on the diplomatic stage and uh, uh, got Turkey and Greece to... to uh, begin talking to each other again. And since then, if you look at the news, as we all do, you'll notice that there has not been any Turkish oil and gas exploration vessel in the Eastern Mediterranean, not since, I guess, it was August of 2020. And it's been a conscious policy by Ankara to de-escalate, especially by not having exploration vessels for oil and gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. So Turkey's sending a signal. Okay, we got it. <laughs> we, over, we overplayed our hand. And I think with the departure of Donald Trump, they started to see a, a reorientation of the Middle East and the maximum policy uh, on Iran, maximum pressure policy on Iran was going away. 
And the deck started to get reshuffled and we've seen normalization of relations begin between Turkey and UAE, Turkey and Egypt, Turkey maybe in Saudi Arabia, and as Swat was saying, maybe Turkey and Israel. So Turkey is poised on the eve of Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine to play some sort of a role that is uh, de-escalatory. Uh, and if you read foreign policy self-pronouncements by senior Turkish officials, whether it's the foreign minister or the presidential uh, communications director, you'll see a self-image, a self-image of Turkish foreign policy that differs dramatically from what we see or what you see in Washington or Brussels or elsewhere, which is Turkey as a, a, a source of stability. I mean, this, is, this will come as a huge surprise, of course, to leaders in Nicosia and Athens and Paris. But Turkey sees its interventions in northern Syria, in Libya, uh, in Azerbaijan as ways to reduce tension and to defend Turkey's national interests in the case of Syria, reduce tension by pushing away what Turkey views as a terrorist organization, the YPG, uh, uh, also de-escalation by creating a safe zone for refugees in Idlib province that Russia uh, violated and Turkey ended up fighting on the battlefield using its drones and long, uh, artillery with Russian troops and with Assad's troops uh, in Idlib uh, two years ago. So again, I'm, I'm not trying to defend Turkey or attack it. I'm saying this is, I think, the self-image of Turkish foreign policy in Ankara. Uh, and so playing this mediation role that, that, by the way, the Ukrainian government continues to welcome, but the mediation role between, uh, between Russia and Ukraine is in keeping with this two year going now attempt by Turkey to try to be a stabilizing force in its region. And that's a very complex region as we all know. I mean, Turkey is simultaneously, of course, a Black Sea power, a Balkans power, a Middle Eastern power, uh, power a South Caucasus power. It's all of the above, not to mention its uh, Turkic ambitions, which I believe are more nostalgic than strategic uh, for Central Asia, as Suat was saying. I don't think there's a grand design by Turkey to grab territory or, or uh, exert its influence in, uh, in an oversized way in Central Asia, but I think Turkey would like to build upon cultural ties and historic ties and do business there, just as Turkey's doing business in Africa. So coming back to Ukraine, Turkey's trying to play this mediation role. Um, yes, it has not joined sanctions, which is, I think, uh, problematic for, for, for the NATO alliance when you've got people across the transatlantic community saying, now is the time to choose. You're either against Russia now or you're with Russia. But simultaneously, Turkey has done some dramatic things uh, to support Ukraine. It has condemned uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea from the very beginning. You could say that's because Crimea had a Turkic history. But Turkey has also condemned the invasion of Ukraine. It's consistently supported Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's consistently supported the NATO aspirations of Ukraine and Georgia, more vocally than the vast majority of NATO member states. And maybe most significantly right now, it has supplied uh, the TB2 drones that have been responsible for the deaths of a lot of Russian soldiers and maybe to a significant extent for the sinking of the Moskva cruiser because now it's coming out that it was TB2 drones that seem to have uh, engaged and confused the, the air defense systems, the radars of the Moskva, which allowed the Ukrainian uh, Neptune missiles to strike the Moskva uh, at wave top level, so undetected by, by those air defense systems. So Turkey is, from its perspective, I think, trying to reduce tension in a, in, in a not naive way, realizing who the aggressor is, realizing that if Russia succeeds here, it's bad for all of us in NATO but not wanting to inflame Putin uh, so that Turkey can still elevate its own importance by being a mediator. So how has this approach rebounded in the South Caucasus and Central Asia? I don't see at all yet, really. Uh, in, in, in Azerbaijan, I think Turkey and Azerbaijan pushed hard for there to be a, a Turkish peacekeeping presence in Agdam uh, to offset the much larger, granted, much larger Russian peacekeeping force in Azerbaijan. Nonetheless, Turkish peacekeepers on the ground in, in Azerbaijan are NATO's eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, so that's a net plus for NATO to have some Turkish peacekeeping presence in Azerbaijan. It's still there. It's going to remain there. Um, Turkey is supportive of Azerbaijan and Armenia normalizing their relations. It's, it's grown even more vocal about that since the war in Ukraine has begun. 
Armenia-Turkey normalization discussions are, are ongoing. Uh, and so I, I see Turkey as kind of continuing uh, with where it was uh, after uh, the second, uh, and during the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, unchanged by what's happened in the, uh, due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And, and I, I think Turkey will remain on sort of that steady state course unless Russia, God forbid, wins unless, and whatever that means, but unless Putin somehow achieves his objectives in Ukraine, then I think we might see Turkey uh, be forced to be more aggressive uh, and, and less, uh, uh, playing less of a mediation role. My very last comment is, I think the other watershed event for Turkey was July, 2020, when the United States was totally absent when there were the clashes along the Azerbaijan-Armenia border. I don't mean the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, I mean the clashes along the Azerbaijan-Armenia uh, international border. Um, you, I've argued in the past that the Minsk group uh, didn't have any, uh, any mandate to do anything in that area because its mandate is inside of Karabakh. But if you're a Minsk group co-chair like the United States or like France, you have, a, you have an obligation no matter what to try to play a role to you know, prevent the situation from escalating uh, along that Azerbaijan-Armenia uh, uh, border. So there was a, a diplomatic vacuum that emerged. Russia filled it right away. Uh, Russia called snap military uh, drills with Armenia in, in late July, early August. Turkey followed suit with Azerbaijan uh, and de facto also co-filled the vacuum that I think the U.S. left uh, in this capacity as a Minsk group uh, mediator. France then, I think, disqualified itself as, as a Minsk group mediator when uh, on November 10th, the very day the ceasefire statement was signed among Russia, Armenia, uh, and Azerbaijan, the foreign minister of France came out and clearly took the side of Armenia and, and attacked Azerbaijan for Azerbaijan's aggression uh, in the second Nagorno-Karabakh war. So there's a vacuum there. Turkey is filling it along with Russia. And I think Turkey's eyes are really on Russia in Azerbaijan. Uh, and where things will go from here depends on how successful uh, Ukraine is in thwarting Putin's invasion of its own territory. And of course, that goes back to the rest of us in the transatlantic community, getting U Ukraine the military support it needs and the diplomatic support it needs while the Ukrainians them themselves fight, bleed, uh, and die for themselves and for all of us. Thank you. Well, can I tell you from You hear me now? Yep. We now turn to Dr. Svante Cornell, who, as I mentioned earlier, was the founder of the turkeyanalyst.org, which I hope you are all following closely uh, as a very reliable and, and challenging source on the, on the country and the region. Uh, he is a graduate of the Middle East Technical University in, in, um, in Ankara and also a PhD from Uppsala and is our glorious chairman of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute uh, in Washington and in Stockholm. Um, Dr. Cornell. Thank you very much. Um, I will follow on the, in the footsteps of some of what Suat and Matt have said uh, and try to look a little bit into what this might hold for US policy in the region, um, which at this point, I wanna start out by reminding everyone uh, there is uh, a couple of big bureaucratic um, uh, boundaries, as Matt would know well in the U.S. government, where Turkey uh, and the Caucasus and Central Asia are treated as very disparate entities with very often very little um, view or understanding of how these uh, areas really interact with one another and how the same logics apply in different parts of this region, broader region. Um, talking about the... Turkish interest in this region uh, is a challenge because it has very much gone up and down, as we uh, several, both Swat and Matt alluded to. Uh, I lived in Turkey when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, and I remember what I can't agree more with Swat about the romantic interest in the early 1990s 
um, that was this, that was displayed by a lot of the Turkish uh, um, commentariat, if you will. Um, I think this was replaced by a much more serious approach already by the late 1990s. Uh, what would have happened if Turkey had not gone through a massive financial and then political turmoil from 2000 to 2002? We don't know. But I think it's clear that the romantic interest, by the way, focused very largely on Central Asia. You know, our grandfathers came riding from Central Asia, is what you would hear very frequently by people who basically look like me. Uh, probably their grandfathers were from the Balkans, but in the Turkish, um, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the narratives of the Turkish nation, there is very much this idea of the connection uh, to Central Asia. Now, the... Um, it was so what I'm trying to say, it was very little less focused on the Caucasus than on Central Asia. But by the time already by the late 1990s that a pragmatic approach had replaced the romantic approach, uh, what Suad said was absolutely true that the emphasis on Azerbaijan, the, Azerbaijan is a special case, both because of geographic proximity, but also for the cultural proximity and the relative openness of Azerbaijan compared to, say, Turkmenistan, which also has a uh, cultural proximity to Turkey, perhaps even stronger. It's also a Sunni nation, uh, whereas Azerbaijani, Azerbaijan is majority Shia. A lot of Turkish businesses in Turkmenistan, but you don't have the same people-to-people -people interaction that you have with Azerbaijan. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing is also at the political level, we've seen uh, since then, of course, a lot of ups and downs, twists and turns. Um, so I'd mentioned how the AKP um, was not particularly interested in this region. Um, I would go even further. I would say that they largely, with some exceptions, uh, ignored Central Asia and the Caucasus. They, there was at first um, a very significant interest in the EU, uh, partly because of the Turkish economy and partly, I think, in hindsight of the AKP's and, and Erdogan's interest in consolidating power, uh, for which the EU and the US were allies against the Kemalist bureaucracy. <clears throat> uh, after that, we see how the Turkish interest turns squarely to the Middle East, uh, with a foreign policy in the Middle East under Erdogan and Davutoglu that uh, really was a failure, I think we can say today, in this attempt to establish a kind of a Turkish, not a sphere of influence really, but something close to a sphere of influence after the Arab uprisings of 2011. Now, I think what's interesting is we, we see a very big uptake in Turkish interest in, 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 in the Caucasus of Central Asia after the failure of the Middle Eastern gambit, if you want to call it that. And I think that's interesting because that leads to the question, well, is the interest that we now see uh, from Turkey towards this region, is it going to last or are we going to see another shift? Of course, no one can know. Uh, but I think it's important to look at the origins of the shift, and I think they are partly pragmatic. They're partly pragmatic because uh, obviously the fact that Turkey had uh, failed in its uh, approach to the Middle East uh, is something that means, well, if you want to be a regional power, and Turkey has the economy and the military for power to be uh, a regional power, or what's the region in which Turkey is looking for to be a regional power? So by default, you have to look elsewhere, and that makes it natural to look at places where you might be welcomed, which includes both the Caucasus, but also Central Asia, and particularly after the uh, change of power in Uzbekistan, the Karim of government was very skeptical to Turkey, particularly to the Islamist inclinations uh, under Erdogan. But we see under Mirziyoyev much more of an open to uh, explore the relationship with Turkey. And I think that's, uh, that's a very important factor. Uzbekistan is, after all, the largest country by far in Central Asia. But I think there is also a political aspect because the, uh, the, uh, the political balances in Turkish domestic politics shifted. Uh, and I, I argued long before this happened that, you know, you have to look at the different um, demographics in Turkey that are represented through different political parties and also in the Turkish bureaucracy, where there is a more, should we call it a liberal intelligentsia that is interested in Europe. It's not particularly interested in the Middle East and it's definitely not interested in the, in, in the countries of Central Asia and the Caucasus very much. Uh, there is then the Islamists and the Islamists, like Erdogan himself, they feel an affinity more with the Arab Middle East because they're real Sunni Muslims, quote unquote, than with the uh, post-Soviet Muslims of Central Asia and the Caucasus, where, you know, to many Turkish Islamists, you know, these are really questionable Muslims in many ways. They might drink too much, they might eat pork and, you know, all this stuff. Uh, whereas the Turkish nationalists, which on, don't only come in the lunatic fringe, which you also have in Turkey, but a lot of the traditional center-right in Turkey that was personified by the uh, 
political parties of Azal, Demirel, Sansu Chiler, and so on. On. They have a nationalist affinity. They have an affinity for the Turkic world. It doesn't mean that they want to be conquerors and take it over, but it means that they feel an affinity. And I think this affinity matters. It matters in terms of where Turkey wants to project its power. Its uh, power. It's not a coincidence, I think, that the um, the uh, the uh, investment in, in of a military nature in Azerbaijan and the Caucasus took place after the uh, shift in Turkey following 2013, really, but which was consummated, if you will, with the coup, in which you see uh, the, um, the result of an Islamist civil war between Erdogan and Fethullah Gülen, leading to a vacuum, and the vacuum, uh, and by vacuum, I mean the large cadres loyal to Gülen that had been the supporters and implementers of, of the government in some ways, uh, were replaced by more traditional nationalist forces uh, within the Turkish bureaucracy. Uh, people with a greater affinity for Central Asia and the Caucasus, and you know, I would, I would say both uh, the military and the intelligence services where this type of people are well represented, have a much uh, larger influence in Turkish policy making than they had a number of years ago. This, of course, is difficult to substantiate by any type of facts, but I think we can see that the priorities that the Turkish government has been following um, uh, on regional affairs are very much more aligned with the priorities of uh, the, this type of nationalist uh, uh, groupings than they do with anything that Erdogan has done in the past. Erdogan has changed, yes, but he's not alone and there are people under him and that matters. And if you want to ask whether this is going to continue, I think there is uh, an important fact, which is that if you look at polling in Turkey, you see a very strong nationalist orientation, including of the Turkish youth. And this means, I think, that the, uh, the interest in Central Asia and the Caucasus, it seems to me, is not likely to be something passive, passing that is going to be um, swapped for some interest in you know, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, or anything else anytime soon. I think there is a good chance that this is going to remain, perhaps not the main priority, but a significant priority in Turkish foreign policy for the foreseeable future. And I think what Turkey has done in Azerbaijan is also lasting. This is not something from which Turkey could easily just uh, you know, give up and extricate itself. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that was true even under, uh, under the period of Erdogan's most ardent Islamism. Uh, and that's going to be uh, the case in the future as well. Now, of course, we have the, the big problem or perhaps the biggest problem from a, an American point of view is a relationship with Russia. Uh, I very much uh, support what Matt said and also what Swat said before. We, uh, in Washington, there is a lot of misunderstanding, uh, uh, willful and less willful about why Turkey had this relationship with, uh, with Putin and why that uh, got in intensified so strongly following the coup. Uh, I very strongly agree that the, the coup, uh, you know, something we had forgotten, of course, a year later that, well, there was a coup in Turkey, everybody moved on. But in Turkey, the, the implications of this event were, were, were truly very significant. And it also took place exactly at the same time that the U.S. was supporting the, uh, the, 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 the Kurdish fighters um, uh, in Syria that, of course, happened to be affiliated with an organization that both the U.S. and Turkey considered to be a terrorist organization. The fact that these two things happen at the same time is what I, I, I think we should be happy there wasn't a total rupture in Turkish-US relations. And I think there are a lot of people who worked very, uh, very under, very quietly in order to make sure that didn't happen. Um, but I think what, what, what we see is that Turkey is backing away to some extent from this. Of course, Turkey doesn't want to lose face. Erdogan cer cer certainly doesn't want to lose face in terms of what to do, what to do with the S-400s. And when the US Congress you know, puts ultimatums, it makes it very hard for Turkey to, to, to answer to this ultimatum because Turkey doesn't look uh, at itself as either a vassal of the United States or of Russia, but as an independent power in its own right that can't just, uh, you know, um, be affected by blackmail. So I think we have to be more creative in finding ways to, to deal with this. And it's also clear, I think, that Turkey wants a functional relationship with uh, Moscow. And I think part of this is uh, related to how you perceive the Ukraine war. Uh, I agree with everything that was said about how Turkey was, of course, not pleased by this war. Um, Turkey has very significant cooperation with Ukraine that was important to Turkey's own defense industry development, by the way. Um, but it's also a fact that if you sit in Turkey, um, you experience a lot of conflicts regionally, such as the Syria war, which had a, a human impact that was probably larger uh, than what's going on in Ukraine, at least thus far. And many people in Turkey would say, well, where was the 
where was the uh, the outrage compared to what we're seeing now in Europe? Uh, and I think if you look at polling in Turkey, you also see that there is there is a very different perspective on this war than what you see in the West. You see a lot of people. I saw some polls recently that actually were uh, people blamed uh, NATO and the U.S. more than Russia for the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, of course, this in some ways could be uh, malleable as a result of the Turkish uh, media, government controlled media in particular, and how it reports on things. Uh, but I think we have to remember that this, from a Turkish perspective, this doesn't look exactly the way it looks uh, in the United States or in Western Europe. There is a different perspective on, on this conflict, uh, whether it's right or not, not is, is, is a different question. Uh, as Matt also mentioned, uh, there are a lot of things that Turkey has done. And I think, you know, uh, when you say Turkey is sitting on the fence, I don't think that's entirely correct. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Turkey's fence sitting, uh, but I think that's because Turkey has focused, or, or let me put it this way, the leadership in Turkey has understood that you can do a lot of things that challenge Russia's interest if you don't scream and yell about it. Uh, so the Turkey has kept the rhetoric relatively low and relatively measured. Uh, it's condemned uh, the invasion uh, and so forth, but it hasn't been yelling on the barricades as some Western leaders have, uh, which has allowed Turkey to maintain a channel of communications with the Russians, um, uh, which is of course a form of hedging, if you will, while at the same time doing a lot of things, and I won't go into them because Matt already did, uh, in terms of uh, supporting the Ukrainian war effort, and in many ways, practically de facto taking sides, being a loyal NATO member in, in the situation. Now, Going forward, I think there are a couple of questions. Uh, I already talked about how Turkey's orientation towards the uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus is likely to remain a fixture of Turkish foreign policy. Um, I think it's also clear that before this war started, we saw uh, Turkey working uh, very actively to institutionalize its relationship, not just bilaterally, but also multilaterally through the upgrading of the Turkic Council to an organization of Turkic states. We don't know what this is going to mean exactly. I think we'll have to wait for a while. Uh, my light went off, okay. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have to see what that means uh, in practice. And I think for a while we may not see so much happen in terms of big news headlines, but I think there, there might very well be work in order, done in order to, up, to really make this a functioning and serious institution. Uh, as I already mentioned, the big shift in Central Asia is the uh, Uzbek welcoming of Turkish influence and a, a significant relationship with Turkey in the region. Both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan now have this. Of course, Turkmenistan has its own relations with Turkey. Kyrgyzstan has always been welcoming of a Turkish presence. Tajikistan, for cultural reasons, is an outlier, but even there, Turkey has been developing a presence as well. Um, it's, it seems to me that as we look at this situation going uh, into the future, um, the Turkey and US might have their differences, uh, especially in areas of the Middle East, there is a gridlock, there are, um, there are locked positions, maybe some of that will change with Turkey's opening to Israel, but I think there is a, a considerable overlap that hasn't been exploited or, uh, or, or looked into in terms of the common interests that the US and Turkey have in supporting the sovereignty and independence of the states of the Caucasus and Central Asia. Uh, including uh, shoring up Georgia, um, where Turkey has is a, is a very significant power. And that this is a new geopolitical reality in which I see no other uh, likely scenario, but a long time containment and possibly a rollback of Russian influence. Uh, and I think Turkey has already for several years been actively uh, containing Russian influence in, in a lot of places, from Syria, as was mentioned, to uh, Libya and now into the Caucasus, and I would say de facto today also in Ukraine. Um, it seems to me that there is a lot of room for uh, coordination, for discussions uh, between Turkey and the US together with Central Asian and Caucasus partners. Uh, we know where a lot of people stand on the East in front China, we know where China stands. We also know that Japan is uh, a firm supporter of the uh, Western position on Ukraine. On the Western side, you know, we, we know what's going on. We know where Belarus stands, we know where Poland stands and so on. But we have this big Southern area ranging from Turkey all the way to the Chinese border where uh, there is a lot of diplomacy that could be done and that needs to be done in order to, uh, to allow, if you will, the countries across this geography to really uh, have a voice and to develop their voice because they know that the consequences for them of taking a stand against Russia are can be very significant. 
Um, there is also an economic dimension to this, of course, with the uh, uh, cutting of uh, transportation links across Russia, Ukraine into Europe and Russia, Belarus into Europe, of the uh, Trans-Caspian Corridor again being uh, very significant. Turkey and the US worked very productively um, 20 years ago to develop this infrastructure, more so in the oil and gas sector, less so in the railway and uh, railroad sec sector, because the US was, for domestic reasons, not a supporter of those projects, at least not concretely. But as these new patterns uh, develop, I think there is uh, a lot of uh, potential for cooperation on this. But as we go forward, it seems to me that the big question on the horizon is uh, Turkey's capacity, and that directly relates, of course, to the Turkish economy. Uh, in, in, to a large extent, the economic troubles of the 1990s, I lived through the inflation of the 1990s, and that had a direct impact on Turkey's ability to project power and to actually function as a regional power. Even though Turkey today is very different from what it was in the 1990s economically, the downturn in the Turkish economy has been very significant, and we now have inflation rates that compare to those of the 1990s, and that, I think, uh, really um, questions what Turkey will be able to do uh, and Turkey's own political stability in, if these, uh, this type of inflation continues to, uh, to fester. And that leads to questions for the United States as well. What does the United States want? Uh, where does the United States want to see Turkey? How does the United States want to uh, or would like to influence Turkey? Uh, what's the combination of sticks and carrots? And I think for a while, because of reasons that Matt alluded to in terms of how we view Turkey, we've had a, an approach that very strongly favored sticks. Uh, it seems that we have a new situation. It might be time to revisit, uh, revisit some of the uh, tactics that we've used in terms of uh, influencing Turkish behavior. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> These are very rich and well-informed presentations. I'm a little worried, however, that we have uh, with our hands and minds have, have uh, uh, touched on, on all the various uh, parts of the elephant, but, not, but the elephant has eluded us. Um, and what I want to raise is this, that, that these events in Ukraine, no matter how they come out, uh, have, they are a crisis of the uh, biggest land mass on, on earth. Uh, political crisis internally, no matter what happens. If, if Putin wins, if Putin loses, either way, it, uh, it is a realization of his uh, observation a generation ago that the collapse of the USSR was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Now, uh, it, it, no matter what happens, in other words, it seems to me other former states of the Soviet Union, now sovereign, are going to be under great pressure, all the way from Finland, all the way, if you will, all the way around the loop to the Chinese, to the Chinese border. Uh, this is a reality. Now, the question is, what role, if any, will Turkey play in addressing this issue, in seeking some new balances, if if it's going if it's going to have this this constructive and moderating role, which which you all have ascribed to it, it's going to continue along this line. Then it has to come up with a much more serious uh, uh, approach to not just caucuses where it's had traditional interests and engagement, but Central Asia as a whole. And by the way, I'd add Afghanistan to that. In other words, there's a big realignment that is taking place uh, or beginning to take place. And it, 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 we have not a, we're not talking about a, an ethnic arc here. Uh, and you all have been, I think, correctly not dismissive, but um, have minimized the ethnic factor uh, as rather romantic, although it may be a more active agent among, among the young in Turkey today, we'll see. But, but it is certainly uh, one, a, a, regional, a regional issue. And, and we're not used to thinking that the region of Central Asia, the Caucasus, extends right up to Turkey. And, and that, the, uh, that the relations there are much closer, 
uh, than they are with, with, for example, the Middle East or China uh, or Pakistan going in other directions. Um, so one, one can imagine in this situation that Turkey is going to be faced with the, the challenge. Are, are you going to step up and play an active and constructive role as a convener, uh, as, as, as a, a force that is bringing, bringing the states together, or rather should they do it themselves and maybe in a second phase engage Turkey? Uh, it, it's, it, 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 this is an open question, of course, but I would like to ask you, uh, is this bigger geopolitical issue taking place, namely the extended end of the USSR, is Turkey going to uh, embrace this in a serious way, or is it going to continue to improvise cleverly and constructively, as you all said it is done in the last uh, decade? Floor is open. <laughs> if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do a few comments and actually um, a few things that I wanted to say but forgot to say. Uh, I agree with you, Professor Starr, that this is a, a historic moment. And I actually think this is the uh, extension of, of the uh, demise of the, the Soviet Union. I mean, this is a delayed uh, and, and I think a process that will complete uh, the, the dissolution of, of that entity. Uh, at least in the minds, I think, of, of some of the Russian elite. And, and it seems to a good extent of the Russian population as well, uh, given all the, uh, the, the brainwashing of, of, of the, the Putinist media over there. But from, from a Turkish perspective, uh, and actually I'm, I am in Ankara right now, uh, I've been following this here on the ground and um, it's been a very surprising, uh, first of all, many people did not expect uh, Russia to actually invade Ukraine. So it's been a surprise for many, despite the United States actually for months signaling that this is going to, to take place. And actually, I, have, I spoke to some Swedish diplomats who were not believing it until the very last minute that it actually, that they would actually invade. But here, I think one of the most important takeaways for me was a how actually quickly the uh, the Western alliance, NATO, and especially the Europeans uh, have quickly come together. Uh, you know the 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 Erdogan media has been entertaining for years this the demise of the West, both morally and um, uh, militarily, and and. Uh, overall economically as well. So this quickly coming together, the sanctions coming one after the other, the dismal performance of the Russian armed forces in Ukraine, uh, and the fighting will and power of the Ukrainians has rekindled uh, and brought about a serious rethink about what Turkey's relationship should be with NATO, the United States, and the Europeans. The German turnaround, although the Scholz government is not following up what they earlier said, uh, and there's a lot of criticism towards the Germans because of that, but in, in effect, and I, I don't think this is only something uh, peculiar to the Turks. I think many were surprised by how much this invasion has re-energized uh, the Western alliance, especially the Europeans who were, who were under the assumption that for decades that they would be able to enjoy this welfare without investing in defense and without really, uh, you know, well, pretty much outsourcing it to the United States that they could get away with it. And I think uh, the Turks here also, um, unwillingly had to accept that the Russians can be very dangerous. They can invade a country, a UN member in broad daylight and inflict serious war crimes on Ukraine. And don't forget the Black Sea, I mean, after the uh, annexation, the illegal annexation of the Crimea, 
the, 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 the shift of power in the Black Sea has been at the expense of Turkish dominance, of Turkish naval dominance in the Black Sea. So the scenario where all of Ukraine's Black Sea borders would be under Russian control is something, is the last thing that the Turkish security establishment would want. So it's been a wake up call. And I think people also growingly realize in Ankara that this is a historic shift that we will not go back to the 23rd of February, 2022. There will be a new world there and it may, uh, it may drag on. This process may not complete immediately in the, in the year or two, but there is certainly, you know, I, I spoke to some of the Crimean Tatar diaspora here as well. There's certainly hope that they actually, they actually are very hopeful that they may actually try get Crimea back. It may not look very realistic in the short term, but you know, no one knows how this will impact the, you know, Russia domestically. And it doesn't look good. Even if they get the, the whole Donbass and you know, manage to maintain the Crimea, there is no Ukrainian president who can, even if he would want to, who can sign a piece of paper that says, we give up on our sovereign rights of the Donbass and Crimea. So this is likely to continue. And I don't think this will look pretty for Mr. Putin at the end. Okay. So uh, one, one more sentence, and then I, I, I'm sorry, it's been long. A, there's been a shift of perceptions in Ankara. There's, a, there's something new is coming. B, if the Americans and the Europeans play this smart and understand the real estate value of Ankara again, and of course, in view of next year's election, it's not so much out of the realm of possible that Turkey could actually be become engaged and, and a partner uh, of, of the West as, uh, again. Very interesting. Now, let me, let me ask you this. The subject is Turkey and Caucasus and Central Asia. And uh, my question is this. How how great is really is the distance between say Moldova and Ukraine on the one side and Central Asia, the Caucasus countries on the other, in that they are all formerly part of the USSR or the Soviet sphere, uh, which Mr. Putin is eager to to re reestablish and is willing to take very strong steps to do so. Now. Within that region, Caucasus and Central Asia, there is a, a natural desire in, on the part of all the governments to resist the divide and conquer uh, tactics that Moscow has applied against them. Um, and, and to resist this and, and to do so in, in, very deftly and very cautiously, but nonetheless decisively, they're linking arms. They're, they're forging ties among themselves, which uh, initially were uh, confined to Central Asia, uh, but now uh, they, they are definitely reaching across the, the Caspian to, to the Caucasus. So we're talking about the emergence of some kind of region there. The question in my mind is this, is Turkey going to be uh, uh, a, itself an organizer of this? Is it going to take any active role or is it going to instead be a, a well-wisher? Uh, 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 it will in various ways support the self-organization that's going on on a regional basis, but not uh, aspire to be a major player in it. Which of these two alternatives is Turkey going to take? Fred, can I jump? Can I jump in because your question, you you re, sort of restated your, your your original question, and then we have two questions in the chat, uh, Marsha Olive and, and Damian Miskovic, that are getting at your question in a different way, asking if the Turkic Council can, what, what role can it play in doing this and and be a a vehicle for Turkey to do just what you're calling about, which is fill fill the vacuum, fill the strategic vacuum, and take advantage of these trends and these desires by the states of Central Asia and the South Caucasus to, to work together now, now that, that Putin has really shown his, his fangs to them. So, and, and whether, and how active will Turkey be? I think that, as Swat was saying, it's gonna, Turkey's reaction is gonna depend on how much the United States, whether or not you believe it's a declining power, 
how, how, how much it reaches out to Turkey and wants Turkey to play that role. I don't think Turkey's going to take the lead and be the organizer. I, I just don't think that's in its, its, its diplomatic and geostrategic DNA at this point. Um, but I do think it is going to use a Turkic council to, to forge those ties and, and strengthen them as much as possible. Nostalgic ties, as I put it before, or romantic, as Suat and Svante put it. I think, you know, th th we're going to see more of these diaspora uh, meetings of, the, of the, the Turkic diaspora, like happened uh, uh, a month or so ago or three weeks ago in Bursa. Uh, and I think that Turkey will use energy. Uh, Marsha's question is about the, you know, the multimodal transportation corridors uh, across the Caspian. Um, I think we've already seen that in late November in the buildup to the war when Turkmenistan, Iran, and Azerbaijan signed an agreement on swaps of natural gas, which Turkey strongly supported quietly in the background because some of that, a lot of that gas is going to come to Turkey and go onward to Europe. So I think Turkey's going to play the, trans the, the, the cross Caspian uh, card. It's going to use the Turkic Council uh, as much as it can, but I think it's, it's, it's limited. It's never going to be, I think, the tip of the spear that's going to uh, push back uh, against Putin. And I think it really does come back to the U.S. showing some leadership. My last comment is Fred and, and Svante and Swat, you'll recall, you know, after Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, of course the U.S. and EU response was, was really weak. And I lost uh, a lot of hair and, and energy uh, uh, fighting <laughs> and winning some battles, losing some others. What are one of the big policy responses that we came up with was that we would do everything we can to support the, the belt of countries to the south of Russia. I mean, just what you said, Fred, the countries of uh, the South Caucasus and Central Asia and make them some successful, uh, make them or, or strengthen their, 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 their push and their attraction toward Turkey and therefore the rest of the transatlantic community. And it was half-hearted. We didn't really follow through. We didn't really have a strong anchor of reform that we should have been pursuing, but we really, our, our hearts weren't in it either and we got distracted. So I think now is the time really to focus on Uzbekistan with Mirza Yoyev's reform program as Svante talked about, really groundbreaking and under assault. Putin is gonna flex his muscles in Central Asia and in Moldova and in Georgia, no matter whether he wins, in Ukraine or he loses. If he loses, he's going to have to look tough back at home. Either way, it's going to be tough on the Central Asians. Uh, and so I think it's time to do everything we can to help the Mirzoyoya forces succeed in trying to create a modern Uzbekistan and not let it get sucked back into Moscow's orbit. Any other comments on that? Um, well, I think there, there's a short one. I think there is something interesting we can learn, I mean, there are many things we can learn from the uh, war in between Armenia and Azerbaijan two years ago. One is that Russia seems willing to accept the growing influence of non-Western powers on what used to be the Soviet Union's territory. We see this with China and Central Asia. We see this with Turkey and the Caucasus now. Um, and that, you know, leads, we, we can't litigate the big discussion about what motivates Mr. Putin, but I think what we can safely say is that he changed his approach to the West after the color revolutions, not because NATO was expanding into the former Soviet, Soviet you know, Warsaw Pact and so on, but because he saw the Western influence as a threat against his own regime. China and Turkey are not perceived that way by the Russians. And I think that's important because if the US, particularly in this very conflictual relationship with Russia uh, independently, uh, just walks in and establishes his presence in Central Asia and the Caucasus, first of all, we have very little credibility after Afghanistan and many other things, including what Matt Reiser mentioned about the US basically absolving itself of any responsibility in the Caucasus. Uh, it also will be, you know, the Central Asians and Caucasians will be very cautious how they respond to the U.S. because, you know, they don't know how the Russians are going to react and they don't know if the U.S. is going to be there tomorrow. However, uh, Turkish influence in this region is something that works directly against Russian influence and is something that is not directly translated into U.S. influence, but at least it's a partner and it's something that can be made a better partner than it has been for the past number of years. So I think that's another logic in which US support and US coordination with Turkey as, a, as an independent force in Central Asia and the Caucasus makes a lot of sense because it's something that is less, shall we say, 
uh, it's it's going to send um, uh, you know it's going to be something that is more acceptable to to the Russians. It's not going to drive the Russians crazy the way a direct American presence would. Well, I think we we've, we've uh, really opened a vast territory here, uh, and maybe we shouldn't claim to have done so. I think Mr. Putin has done so. And your various observations are extremely interesting and provocative. Uh, time will tell. I, I think, though, uh, one implication of all that's been said is no matter what happens uh, in, in Ukraine, Putin wins or loses. Either way, it poses very serious questions for uh, Turkey, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. Now, in addressing them, uh, and addressing what looks likely to be a continued threat from Moscow, uh, and very serious. Well, no one in the region doubts that that's the case, by the way. The question is, who's going to do it? You've expressed a certain amount of skepticism about the United States. This is an opportunity, uh, especially in the economic area, trade and transport. Uh, will the U.S sees it. Well, we don't know. It doesn't look under at the moment, but this uh, that this will be uh, happening. But who knows what will happen a year from now or less than a year from now. Um, will Turkey do it? Well, I the, we've had I've count eight, eight different mentions of the Turkic Council. I would wonder, I would question whether that's a vehicle for accomplishing what we're talking about, because we're not talking about Turkey. Turkey peoples, we're talking about sovereign states. And that's what's at issue here. And the Turkic Council, need, leaving aside the fact that it, it obviously excludes Georgia, it excludes Tajikistan, and let's not forget Turkey's very keen interest in Afghanistan, and the, we, the current situation there is not the end of the story. Uh, leave that aside, it also uh, defines the relation the, these countries in exactly the way exactly the way Putin is defining his country in in, in ethnic and cultural terms uh, rather than in in terms of sovereignties and it seems to me that's the wrong way for Turkey to go uh, it might have a romantic appeal maybe you keep the Turkic Council going but maybe Turkey should consider aligning itself with some emerging ASEAN-like entity in Central Asia and the Caucasus uh, uh, being part of it or have an observer status to it, or it could even be an initiator, but it would have to be something that's based on the principle of sovereignty and not ethnicity, it seems to me. But we'll all see. Uh, this obviously is, is uh, Virgil said, uh, uh, this is in, we're in the middle of things, in media race. It's all happening around us and all this will evolve very quickly in the coming weeks and months. Maybe we can return to this. Meanwhile, I want to thank all three of our speakers. Really, you couldn't imagine a, a more authoritative gang than this. And besides thanking them, I want to encourage everyone to follow turkeyanalyst.org and it, uh, read it, share it with your friends, and if you're among the experts on these matters, write for it. Thank you. <laughs>